Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our World Engineering Day online celebration in Asia and the Pacific. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I'm Jiang Ling from UNESCO Regional Science Bureau for Asia and the Pacific. If you would like more information about our speakers and the program, we will leave everything in this um, folder. So without further ado, let's welcome the introduction speech from Professor Shabazz Khan, who is director and uh, representative from UNESCO Regional Science Bureau for Asia and Pacific. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jia Ying. Very happy World Engineering Day. So we are very lucky today to witness this important day, which is now proclaimed by UNESCO, United Nations Education, Science and Cultural Organization, where I work as the World Engineers Day, World Engineering Day. And very importantly, all colleagues who have contributed from Asia Pacific region, especially Dr. Marlene Kanga. So I congratulate all those efforts through the World Federation of Engineering Organizations to be finally successful in uh, achieving this very important milestone. And I feel very proud to be one of the community and for certainly for all engineers in the world, we will have so many benefits to come by raising the importance of engineering um, to all policymakers, and now especially with the emphasis on the sustainable development goals. So in this context, I would wish to also congratulate our colleagues who are here today, our panelists, and uh, very importantly, our uh, partners, um, the Association of uh, Engineering Education for Southeast Asia and Pacific and uh, the Institution of Engineers Indonesia. And also very importantly, FIAP, the Federation of Engineering uh, Associations in Asia Pacific, represented by Dr. Hantak Chua. We all stand for a very important purpose that how do we standardize the engineering education how do we deal with the big issues which are being faced by the world and what role engineers can play? The 2030 Agenda uh, for Sustainable Development has a very important uh, uh, overall objective of leaving no one behind. So how do we make sure we don't, uh, we, uh, don't leave anyone behind? And within engineering, as we know, in the world, there are countries are, which are very advanced countries and there are countries which are still developing. But we have a right to high quality engineering education, no matter from where we come, where we belong to. And we need to make sure the engineering standards are such which promote mobility of engineers. So that's what we have been trying to work together. And our, our very special centers in China, uh, they are doing a great job on standardizing engineering education. And also today we will be launching a very important uh, a report from our UNESCO headquarters, which will be dealing with engineering issues and SDGs. So I um, ask you to kindly go through related links, uh, read the report with interest, provide us with your feedback. We have more than 300 uh, registrations and from all of those who have registered and have joined, you're most welcome today. If you're an engineer, we welcome you to uh, this event, if you're non-engineer, you are our friend and we work together to make this world a, a better place to live. Lastly, when I was an engineering uh, student uh, in Pakistan many, many years ago, we used to have some very special logos for engineers. And one of those which motivated me as a civil engineering student was uh, engineers keep this world moving. And it's very important for us to keep this world moving because of the COVID challenge, because of the distances we are facing, uh, we have to make sure the world remains interconnected with artificial intelligence, with the ICT technologies, uh, with the technologies such as Zoom, and we continue uh, with professional development. So that's why this very important webinar today uh, is uh, while it is a commemoration of the World Engineering Day, uh, to all who have made a big effort to make it happen within the UNESCO decision bodies, the Executive Board and General Conference, but also to all engineers in the world, let us 
uh, continue to keep this world moving towards better sustainable development. If there are no engineers, there is no development, no sustainable development, I would say. And if there is no engineering profession, everyone would be left behind. So engineering connects us and engineering will make sure that we don't leave anyone behind. So thank you very much. Also to my team, Dr. Ai uh, Jaying and uh, Dr. Sachi and Ms. Fitri for organizing this. Back to you, Jaying. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Shabazz, for the very motivating opening. And next, let's welcome Dr. Helu Dewanto, the president of Association of Engineering Education Southeast Asia and Pacific, and also uh, the Association of Engineers in Indonesia. The floor is yours. Professor Sabas, uh, Professor Sabas Khan, uh, my fellow engineers from uh, ISAP and from PII, uh, distinguished speakers, uh, Dr. Marlene Kanga, Professor Chua, and uh, other distinguished speakers who are present today, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A very happy World Engineering Day to all of you and a very good day to you. It's been a pleasure. It's been a privilege for uh, PII and for ISAP to be able to work together with UNESCO for a joint initiative in publishing a, a book which basically uh, titling Enhancing Inner Value Chain for Global Collaboration to Achieve SDG 2030. The book would be uh, scientifically written by uh, competence uh, authors, and uh, we wish that the book will give all of us a new perspective how we can uh, globally collaborate as engineers to solve the current uh, issues and future global issues, which uh, already uh, stipulated in uh, SDG 2030. Basically, uh, we try to have a peaceful and prosperous world going ahead with leave no one behind. I'm asked to give an opening speech, but also to uh, present a UNESCO, ISAP, and PII joint initiative, joint publication. So let me share with you uh, what is the background of the publication and what is the joint publication all about. I hope we have the slides ready. So basically this is the title of the publication, Enhancing Engineers Value Chain for Global Collaboration to Achieve SDG 2030. Uh, engineers, as Professor Sabas already explained, has played a significant and pivotal roles along the history of mankind starting from the invention of fire, stone tools, spears, and so forth, that brought us into the uh, society 1.0, which is hunters and gatherers society, and then continued with the innovation in agriculture, which brought us into the society 2.0, and the invention of steam engine by uh, James Watt, has brought us into society 3.0, which is the industrial society. And then we move on into the society 4.0 with the invention of uh, personal PC by Bill Gates and Paul Allen, as well as internet uh, innovation by Tim Bunsley. And then we are basically now moving into the uh, realization of society 5.0. Now, as engineers has helped 
to shape the civilization along the history of mankind, we all engineers become also responsible to solve current and future global issues. To achieve SDG 2030s, which is the world blueprint for building a future of peace and prosperity for all and leave no one behind. And we acknowledge that all 17 goals of the SDGs 2030 requires engineering solution within the context of STEM. So what does it take for all engineers to solve the global issues and to meet the SDGs 2030s? It needs a global engineers collaboration. And a global engineers collaboration requires common standard, integration, and visibility. Now we know that there are at least two common standards. The first is engineering education standards. We know there is, or there are Boston Accord, Sydney Accord, Dublin Accord, and Seoul Accord. And secondly is international recognition on professional competence. We acknowledge ASEAN Chartered Professional Engineers, APEC Engineer Registers, IPEA, and so forth. However, we still need integration and visibility for such collaboration. To meet the two common standards, which is engineering education and professional competence standards, we need to enhance the engineer value chain. And the engineer value chain consists of engineering education at universities, which produce bachelor of engineers, engineers profession education, which produce engineer in training, and professional competence development. We, we go through a professional engineer certification. And there is also international PE mutual recognition in the form of multilateral and also bilateral agreement, the mutual recognition agreement. And last, we need and we have also PE registration and development of engineering database in it and many countries. Indonesia has recently uh, successfully uh, developed and transformed the uh, engineering value chain. The engineering value chain uh, starting from the very beginning, which is the uh, engineering education at universities. The transformation is in the accreditation system. And then the second uh, chain, which is engineering profession education, we transform the curriculum standard. And then in the PE certification, we transform the, uh, the arrangement to become a white nation uh, PE certification system involving all the Indonesian engineering associations. And then we also transform the certificate, the, the registration by transforming from manual into digital. And with that, we also have the opportunity to develop for the first time engineering a database for Indonesia. In each of the chain, uh, PII as the uh, institution of engineers mandated by the engineering laws issued in uh, 2014 and uh, strengthened by the government regulation in 2019, uh, determine its role in each of the chain. The first is in engineering patient. The role of PII is to do the accreditation for national accreditation as well as for international accreditation through PII IAB, which is the Indonesian Accreditation Board of Engineering Education. 
who recently has been admitted as the provisional member of Western Court. The second chain is the profession education or engineer profession education. The standard of curriculum jointly developed by PII, the Director General of Higher Education and the National Dean Forum of Indonesia. So the graduates of this program are entitled to a engineer certificate jointly issued by PII and the universities. Now the third chain, which is the professional engineer certification. It is now become mandatory for all practicing engineer in Indonesia, including foreign engineers. And a new nationwide PE certification system is now developed involving all association of engineers accredited by PIA to issue PE certification. The next chain, which is the international recognition, now PI become member of the IMC, Indonesian Monitoring Committee of ASEAN Chartered Professional Engineers, to integrate its all branches as a registration office. We open up possibility to all senior PE to be registered to ASEAN equivalents, and we also maintain PI position at APEC Engineer Register to promote senior PE holders to APEC standard equivalents. In the last chain, which is the registration, we develop a database because all practicing engineers holding PE certificate must be registered by PII. This allows us for the first time to develop an engineer database that consists of detailed logbook of all practicing engineers. The future integration of data with API into a global engineer digital platform. Now, uh, Symbony, which is the Indonesian Engineers Management Information System, support PI role in enhancing engineer value chain. Along the value chain, starting from the beginning until the last value chain. The Symbony, will also function for financial management, human resources, and further be developed for database of engineers, which can be further developed into a big data, which consists of detailed engineers profile and logbook, education certificate, working experience, project, all portfolio awards, innovation, IPs, publication, and everything of individual engineers to be integrated into a big data of Indonesian engineers. Now, with API application programming interface, it will facilitate data exchange and information sharing with other institutions. The stakeholders of uh, engineering in Indonesia consists of government, higher education, industries and companies, association, association of engineers, individual engineers, and also other engineers digital platform like SCP, APEC, and so forth. Basically, this is the idea for uh, integration. To integrate PII database with other engineer digital platform using application programming interface that facilitate data exchange and information sharing, which is uh, integration. Now, with similar approach, we can develop and creating a global PE digital platform at the global level. The ACP digital platform will be developed and have an API interface with Indonesian and other 10 ASEAN countries. In APEC, we can as well do the same, which uh, using API, we can integrate data which in the form of exchange and sharing information and data with other uh, digital platform in the region. At, and at global level, we can do the same with data integration among MRA, including APEC, IPA, and so forth. 
And we can develop selection criteria that uh, consists of certain requirement to form a global PE digital platform. Now, when we have a digital platform for global engineer collaboration, we have what we call it as integration, allowing for collaboration. While most of MRI uh, mutual recognition agreement main agenda is to promote mobility of engineers, we may need also now to refocus our agenda and to go beyond mobility, considering the current uh, pandemic issues into promoting a global engineer collaboration to solve global issues and to achieve SDG 2030s. While we have this global engineer platform, then we can further build a talent pool of selected global engineers with certain skills and criteria to solve and achieve specific goals of the SDGs. We build quad helix of crash letter with industry, government, and so forth, and build analytical with AI and machine learning to support the talent pool in solving global issues. This is the way we build visibility function to monitor progress, KPI achievement in achieving SDGs. Basically, those are the content of the uh, joint publication that we are going to publish with uh, the title of Enhancing Engineer Value Chain for Global Collaboration to Achieve SDG 2030. We look forward to all the support from all engineers to deliver this important publication jointly public, jointly published with UNESCO, ASEAN, and PAE. I think uh, that's for me and thank you again for everyone. Uh, once again, a happy work engineering day to all of you, all engineers around the globe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Heru, for the opening and also the introduction to our joint publications and the uh, global platform, the proposal. Uh, so next, let's welcome Dr. Ai Sugiura, who's the program specialist from UNESCO Jakarta to host the next panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Jain, and thank you, Professor Shabas and uh, Dr. Heru. Uh, yes, yeah, so we would like now to uh, enter the panel discussion where we have uh, eight estimated um, uh, panelists who will give us first a five minute introduction on one specific aspect of uh, uh, engineering education and our accreditation. So first of all, I would like to call uh, Professor Shabas Khan to give us um, his uh, views on UNESCO global and regional efforts in promoting engineering services to society for SDGs. Professor, the floor is yours. Uh, if you can share Dr. Ari, or should I share the PDF? Maybe I can share. Okay. Does it work? Uh, oh, all right. How does it work? Technology. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. And hopefully everyone can hear me. I will be very punctual, I promise, because we are eight panelists. And please stop me I, if I go over five minutes, including the time I wasted. So I'm going to give you an idea about UNESCO's global and regional, and especially for Asia Pacific, what we are trying to do um, to promote engineering services to society, especially for SDGs. And I would like to also acknowledge Datu Lee Cheong, who is in our audience, who has played a very important role, and I will be highlighting the role of our centers. So as the director for the Regional Bureau for um, Science for Asia Pacific, um, I'm very proud to let you know we are serving 49 countries in the region with this map which is shown here. We are bringing sciences for sustainable development and very importantly, how we mobilize science, engineering, technology and innovation. 
and how can we nurture the networks and especially networks which are about science and technology engineering and mathematics and many of the colleagues who have been helping us who are our champions they are in this meeting today sdgs have been mentioned by engineer heru so i will not uh, spend more time on that but really within unesco these five sdgs are directly delivered through seti uh, industry of course the water related sdg the sdg about the cities climate change very importantly we have a climate emergency so we must act now as uh, our secretary general says from the united nations uh, uh, mr guterres and also uh, the environment very very important the sdg number 15 but if you take even present pandemic and health issues we cannot have better health without having proper infrastructure education which is also a global big issue sdg number 4 so and very important gender equality and very proud today to have among us engineers representing both genders and uh, uh, that's how we can make this world sustainable Global Engineering Initiatives, UNESCO has been at the forefront, both from this region and globally. The Engineering Education um, a Report, the report which has been for um, uh, looking into the status of the engineering, but now also looking into the link with the SDGs and WFEO's work for SDGs and now the report which will be launched today. Uh, there are many of those publications available free of charge online and we are promoting hands-on pr uh, practices and workshops for women in engineering and also young girls in ICTs and engineering and youth in engineering, very important initiatives. And you want to learn more, contact Dr. Isegura, who is in charge for this office. Uh, so as I highlighted before, uh, this very important report, Engineering for Sustainable Development, very big role of WFEO, but also our center um, in China, ICEE. So it's a very big uh, publication from the point of view of raising awareness. And as we know, today is the day of the engineers. So it's the day of every one of you. And you will be also see very special chapters there and the chapters by a chapter by Dr. Marlene Kang and many of the colleagues from all around the world. And how can we transform engineering profession? towards greater innovations. Without innovation, this world cannot be sustainable. And we need to think about the new challenges and the multidisciplinarity which is needed. And as I said in my opening remarks, 2030 agenda, leaving no one behind equal opportunities for everyone on the planet from wherever you are coming. We will bring it into our discussion. Also in this region, we have the Meta Knowledge Platform and through Malaysia UNESCO cooperation program. And we will also be hearing from uh, Professor Hantak Chua, some of the work we have been doing on accreditation, Pakistan, Myanmar, Nigeria, Papua New Guinea, Timor-Leste, many countries have benefited from them. So we have now a standard, of course, we have standards with Washington Accord and other, but we are making sure we let people go through what needs to be done. Many workshops um, have been organized about standardizing engineering, and I'm very also thankful for the institution engineers in Indonesia and for institution engineers in Malaysia, uh, the colleagues in Myanmar, in Myanmar Engineering Society and Pakistan Engineering Council, along with also the Australia's Institution Engineers Australia. We have a number of centers and chairs, and ISTIC is at the forefront for South-South cooperation. So uh, Professor Lee Chong has been our champion for promoting South-South cooperation in engineering. Also, we have a center uh, which is promoting space technologies. There are centers like we will be hearing about International Knowledge Center for Engineering Science and Technology, ICAS today, and the report which I introduced before, International Center for Engineering Education. And uh, there are many other centers about engineering and technology and incubation and many UNESCO chairs so I welcome you for you to explore how can you link with them and uh, we are open for business and you can certainly be part of these initiatives. Where we go, since I joined this office uh, about eight and a half years ago and I will be soon uh, moving to our office in Beijing as a representative and director, I have promoted that it's not only science, technology, and innovation. We must put SETI, Science, Engineering, Technology, and Innovation. We are very successful. We have very good uh, private-public multi-stakeholder collaboration. 
And I'm also very pleased to report today that we have major uh, collaboration with countries such as Japan, with Japan Funds and Trust, also with uh, China and with Australia, with Malaysia, as I introduced before. The frontiers such as uh, the ethics of AI, the inclusiveness of science, engineering, technology, innovation, the citizen science, the areas of governor, and the areas related to local indigenous knowledge and open science. And I would say engineering is part of that. So let us continue to build on this South-South cooperation. And also very importantly, how can we improve the engineering qualification standards? Somebody um, graduating from Nepal or somebody graduating from Australia or from US, how they can have same standards. This is really something very close to my heart. And Professor Hentek Chua will elaborate more. How do we promote continuous professional development, especially for SDGs, for human rights, and also for Industrial Revolution 4.0? How do we ignite young people? How do we make sure they, they are learning what are the infrastructure norms and standards and the teaching in the universities is state of the art, no matter from where you come? So with that, I thank you, and we will be able to take your questions through the question answer um, box or through the chat box. And Dr. I said, you and team will bring it to each one of us. So thank you, dear Dr. I. On to the next panelist. Thank you very much, Professor Shabas. So yes, I would like then uh, to call uh, Dr. Marlene Tanga, who is the immediate past president of the World Fair Federation of uh, Engineering Organization. And there was also in 2019 celebrated as uh, one of the top 10 women engineers in Australia. And uh, we'd like uh, to hear from you uh, on uh, the work you're leading uh, on review of international engineering benchmark for graduate attributes and professional competencies for engineers to, the success, uh, to successfully advance the UN SDGs. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. I, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak at this very important event uh, and happy World Engineering Day. Uh, I'm very pleased to, to, to hear uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Hiro DeWanto had to say because there is very good alignment with what WFO has been doing for some years. So for the background of uh, the audience who may not be familiar with the World Federation of Engineering Organizations or WFEO, we are the peak international body for professional engineering institutions founded in 1968 under the auspices of UNESCO. We have some 100 national professional engineering institutions and around 12 continental and regional professional engineering institutions as members representing more than 30 million engineers. And we are the co-chair of the major science and technology group at the UN. We are an associate of UNESCO and we represent uh, engineering at the major UN organizations around the world. A key objective of the World Federation of Engineering Organizations since 2018, during my term as presidency, is to develop the narrative uh, uh, that engineering is required to advance every one of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We have developed this in collaboration with UNESCO and other international engineering organizations. And this work has resulted in some very uh, great outcomes, including the declaration of World Engineering Day for Sustainable Development in November, 2019 because this is an opportunity for us to talk to non-engineers, to government and policymakers in particular, and to young people about the role of engineering for sustainable development. Today, we are going to launch the UNESCO Engineering Report, which has as its title, Engineering for the Sustainable Development Goals. And it aligns with the vision of WFO. And in fact, uh, I, I wrote the leading chapter one, uh, which has a very powerful table, how engineering can make it happen for every one of the sustainable development goals. So I hope that this will be used as, a, as an effective communication tool for non-engineers and especially for young people. And the report also shows that we need to build capacity for more engineers, especially women with the right skills to advance sustainable development. So there are three recommendations 
in chapter one of the UNESCO engineering report to be launched today. And this in summary is that government engineering educators and industry and professional engineering institutions, the quadruple helix that Dr. Devanto mentioned, we have also mentioned uh, back in 2017, uh, and the need to collaborate to increase the number and quality of engineers and the need to work in partnership to develop the necessary international engineering education benchmarks for sustainable development, which has also been mentioned and aligns with the goals and objectives of PII. And also we need recognized world uh, standards across the world to form the basis of national engineering education systems for engineers with the right skills in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. WFEO has an engineering 2030 plan, which Professor Shabazz Khan has just shown you. And this plan outlines 12 principles, the first being to develop the global standards for engineering education and professional development in partnership with other organizations. Secondly, to build capacity for accreditation of engineering education and accreditation bodies, to build capacity for professional engineering institutions, especially in many countries where there are none, and to provide that framework for the engineering profession, to develop professional competency pathways so that graduates meet employer needs, and to support national and international registration for the recognition of qualifications and experience of practicing engineers. So this was put out in December 2017 and then published as our Engineering 2030 report. And as you can see, the key SDGs there are education and partnership for the goals. We have been working with UNESCO and the International Engineering Alliance at the benchmarks for education and looking at the changes that are required because engineering has transformed. As you can see here, it's being increasingly digitized and so what engineers learn today in civil engineering and how they need to practice is vastly different. And of course, engineering needs more brain power, not muscle power, and we need to encourage more women to become engineers. So these are the key areas of change that we have implemented in the new benchmark of the International Engineering Alliance, which is on track for approval at the annual meeting in June, 2021. You can see six, which I won't list because of shortage of time, but two important ones are to incorporate the goals of sustainable development and consider diverse impacts, technical environment, social, cultural, economic, financial, and global responsibility to leave no one behind. Now the benchmarks are, are stated generically they're applicable to all engineering disciplines. It sets out the attributes that are required for a graduate, engineering graduate, that are accessible and that enable the graduate to have the potential to acquire competency to practice at the appropriate level as a professional engineer, technologist, or technician. In addition, we've looked at the professional competency profiles after graduation necessary for expected performance again for the three levels of engineering practice. And so you can see that this reform is, is bringing into line the engineering education benchmarks to meet the goals of sustainable development. The graduate attribute and professional competency framework has five tables. And once again, I will not go into the detail. The tables involve problem solving capabilities, the range of engineering activities, knowledge and attitude profile, and the graduate attributes on graduation and professional competency in practice. These tables four and five are the most important and will have the most impact on the capabilities of engineers in the future. The graduate attributes cover knowledge, they cover how the engineer works with society and how the engineer works with teams and manages their work. And the professional competencies cover, again, knowledge that is acquired during a professional career, how the engineer interacts with society, and here the sustainable development goals are important, and how the engineer manages their activities. 
The full framework is available here in this link and you can take a look as well as to the wide consultation that has taken place around the world. And most importantly, World Engineering Day is an opportunity for us to celebrate. And you can see the 17 sustainable development goals are here in the logo and engineering is making the world go round. So let us encourage young people, boys and girls to consider engineering as a career for a positive change for a better sustainable world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Malin. Um, so I would like uh, then next to uh, request Professor Chua Huintek, the current chairman of uh, Federation of Engineering Institutions of uh, Asia and the Pacific, FIAP, a Standing uh, Committee on Engineering Education, uh, to give his talk about the mobility for engineers and challenges and opportunities. Professor Chua, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning to all my fellow colleagues, uh, Dr. Hiro, Professor Shabakaskan, uh, Dr. Maling, and others. Uh, today, I only have five minutes, so I won't uh, go into much details, except there are a few things that I would like to talk about. Now, everybody of us know that uh, um, we require engineers to move around not only within our country, but to move around the region and the world. So this mobility of engineers, engineering technologies and engineering technicians are very important. So I talk about engineering personnel, which is not just engineer, but also technicians and technologies. And we know the whole world is short of engineers. So what is important is we must have this uh, engineering register that register all the engineers as what uh, Dr. Hiro is talking about because it gives a gateway for trade liberalization and also for professional uh, services. Of course, uh, international cooperation is very important. I take Malaysia, we have 33 million. ASEAN, we have 640 million, if not more. Then we have ASEAN plus China plus Korea plus Japan plus Australia plus New Zealand, which was the original uh, comprehensive economic partnership signed on uh, November 15, 2020. We have 2.3 billion. Then what about the Belt and Road Initiative? It covers about 55% of the world. So we must capitalize on our strength and complement each other. So international cooperation is very, very important. So uh, for mobility of engineering personnel, there are so many uh, agreements, right? We talk about ASEAN Chartered Professional Engineer Register. We started operational in 2005, and these are government initiatives. Then we have a lot of other initiatives by the NGOs, uh, such as the uh, International Professional Engineers Agreement, APEC Engineers, International Engineering Technologies Agreement and the Agreement for International Engineering Technicians, right? I won't go into much detail because of time, but we know International Professional Engineer Agreement started in 2001, whereas APEC Engineers started in about 2000, if I'm not mistaken. And all of them are talking about professional engineers who can practice, uh, give uh, independent practice. Uh, what is important is that, uh, of course, we have other mobility forums like International Engineering Technologies Agreement and Technician Agreement. But what are the major issues? The major issue is with all this agreement, at the end of the day, whether it will be successful or not, is our trust and confidence in the quality of engineering education in different countries, different regions, and the training, our trust in the training of competent engineers. Are there local engineers that will worry about keen competition? Because if you have foreign engineers coming into the country, they may be worried about their rice bowl. And many of the signatories of the agreements are not professional regulatory authorities, but they are just learned society and NGO. So therefore, it is very important for the signatory of the agreement who are learned society and not 
government agency to convince the government and remove all these protectionism uh, rules. And it is also important through all this uh, agreement and through all the platform and all the forum, we must form human network so that we have friends in other countries, we have local partners. And most important, I think, is when we want to go to other region, other country, we must learn their culture, we must learn different civilization. And therefore, in how do we train our engineers to have cultural intelligence is another important thing that we must think about. Now, I, just now I talked about mobility, we must have confidence in the competency of the engineer and the engineering education. And that is all the reason why we must have accreditation because it is a quality assurance process. It allows us to do international benchmarking. It allows us to have further improvement. It gives give assurance to the students, to the potential uh, employers, the graduate school, and even the licensing agency and for regional and international mobility. Now, what I am trying to promote here is that for an engineer, we must learn all our scientific and engineering knowledge. We must know about all our stakeholders' interests, may it be investor, maybe a local community. Then we must learn how to make sound judgment based on all these. Uh, con sometimes the issues are conflicting and come up with some what I call engineering evidence-based solution. It does not run away from what uh, Dr. Marling was talking about of all the attributes, because we, learn, we must teach our students to learn how to do research, learn all the engineering principles, learn the ex from experience of others, collect information, learn how to negotiate through good communication skill, resolving conflicting issues, and finally make sound decision based on cost effectiveness. All right. So this is what I think a competent professional engineer should do. So my proposal is that for World Bank and the Asian Development Bank project, please do consider to give extra points when the companies have uh, international professional engineers or APEC engineers. We must partner with local engineers. We must not talk about head counts. In international collaboration, we must also talk about the value of every item because value of every item is very important. We do not want to say one big project, foreigners come and take all the projects and only leave to the low value to the local. And we must really have technology transfer at every stage from design up to decision making. And we must have succession plan so that local can learn how to take over so that we are all in line with the real 17 UN Sustainable Development Goal through our best practices in engineering projects and also through smart partnership. So I will end here. I think it is just about five and a half minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor Chi. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, no, sorry, yes, uh, I, I will um, now call uh, Dr. Chang Liu, the Secretary General of uh, ICAST, uh, UNESCO Category 2 Center, the International Knowledge Center for Engineering Science and Technology. Uh, so she will talk to us about uh, um, the Open Platform for Global Engineering uh, Initiative that the center is uh, currently um, developing. So thank you. Uh, you? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, dear moderator and my uh, fellow panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, all the participants of the webinar, uh, this is Cathy Liu, and I'm, it's my great honor to introduce to you all ICAST, an open engineering knowledge platform and its solutions to SDGs. My presentation uh, is made up of three parts. First of all, I'm going to give a brief uh, overview of the center and then our, our solutions to SDGs, actually four, uh, four or five of them in particular, and then some of our future plan. Um, so 
actually the full name of ICAST is International Knowledge Center of Engineering Sciences and Technology and the Species of UNESCO, which was funded in June 2014. And the objective of the center is to provide knowledge-based services at a global scale in the form of consultancies, scientific research and education. And our target users are first of all policy makers and then engineering science and te technology professionals, including university staff and students, and then the general public. And in the past uh, five to six years, we have preliminarily formed a one plus one engineering value, value chain through an extensible framework, loose coupling and unified data standards. Um, and over there, actually, you can see there is a chart indicating our organizational structure. You can see that uh, the Chinese Academy of Engineering is actually responsible for the operation and management of such of our center. And uh, you can actually see there are four what we call sub platforms supported by actually leading universities and research institutes in China, right? And um, there were some fundamental concepts behind uh, the establishment of such of our center, which are collaboration, participation, equal opportunities and access, diversity and collective benefit. And then based on all these concepts, we do provide open data, I mean, on our platform or the open engineering knowledge platform, we do provide open data, open educational resources, open platform, open community, open knowledge services, and open training. And then we have this uh, four specialized fields, which we, we kind of regard them as prioritized for us. And they are first of all, disaster risk reduction, and then engineering education, and then intelligent city, and then Silk Road Sciences and Technology. Uh, over there, that's our portal, 3w.icus.org. Um, yeah, I would move to the second part of my presentation today. That is what we have done uh, just now. Um, Professor Shabazz told us that all the 17 goals, SDGs, require engi engineering solutions. And also Dr. Uh, Ken Kenga also told us that uh, the role of the mission of uh, uh, WFEO is to advance UN SDGs through engineering. We, we do agree. And uh, actually, we have focused our attention on five of them, five out of the 17. I guess solution and actions to SDGs focus on SDG 2, 3, 4, 11, and 15. I'm going to give you four examples. Uh, the first one is our response or solution to SDG 3, that is good health and well-being. What we have done is that among the many efforts that have that we have made, one thing is a special column dedicated to COVID-19 prevention control. And in the special column, what we provide, what our users can have free uh, have open access to, uh, for, uh, first of all, information services in terms of policies and regulations, news and measures, expert viewpoints, science express, science popularization, and citizen stories. Uh, apart from those information services, we also provide some knowledge services, say some real-time pandemic statistics and its visualization, and then public opinion analysis, and evidence-based medicine databases, also recorded courses, and relevant academic literature. And our users actually are from uh, 178 countries and regions. And uh, yeah, the overseas, uh, the percentage of the overseas visits uh, have reached 85%, 9%. Okay. And then the second example is our solution to SDG4, quality education. Uh, what we have done, for example, we provide MOOC courses on our platform in multiple uh, fields or Disciplines, some examples are computer and electronic information engineering, electric power engineering, and so on. And also, we provide uh, over 1,200 educational videos in urban planning, disaster risk reduction, engineering education, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and we also 
I will move to the second part. So we also offer both uh, online and offline training workshops. So in the past maybe six years, we have uh, altogether offered 93 training programs to over 13,000 trainees coming from 115 countries and regions. Uh, with the women trainee percentage reaching 35% and the satisfaction of the trainees because we've, we've done a lot of survey questionnaire and then yeah uh, the satisfaction is uh, around 90% and we have also established a special what we call Silk Road training base and online we do provide we do uh, offer this uh, survey and exam right on our platform. And the third example is our solution to SDG 11, uh, that is sustainable cities and communities. Like we uh, have this, uh, what we call apps or uh, application called the Belt and Road Index, uh, the Engineering Investment Potential Index, which intends to offer investment references to businesses and also a science and technology innovation index, which intends to offer references to policymakers about regional science and technology innovation capacity. And also we have what we call CTIQ, uh, which provides visualized, uh, which provides visualized analysis and series of services to evaluate uh, the intelligence levels of cities. It's kind of interesting and give it a try. Okay, and then uh, my last example, but certainly not this one, to, uh, is to SDG number 15, life on land. Uh, like we have uh, a, uh, we have a app called this desertification monitoring, uh, which actually provides desertification monitoring spatial analysis and a series of uh, data products in different time periods. Uh, and also we do provide uh, like information about a special, a typical solution, a typical case of desertification control restoration in Kubuqi. Mm -hmm. So the second part, yeah, we're about some of our solutions through engineering to support some of the uh, focused SDGs. And the last part of my presentation uh, is about what we will continue to do three things first of all to bring together more global data resources and cases in engineering and provide engineering information solutions and decision making references for countries around the world second to form broader cooperation with institutions businesses and universities worldwide establish a source sharing mechanism and the online community uh, and then to promote information exchange within the engineering community, and then uh, support the capacity building of developing countries and support the implementation of the UN uh, SDGs in the, in the Asia Pacific region with special focuses on the following three, like, uh, for example, the first one, this is actually, this three are actually our, our pr prioritized uh, areas which we attach great importance to like uh, contributing to the improvement of urban resilience enhancing sustainable development capacities of cities promoting intelligence levels of cities and second is is the strengthening of integrated capacities of disaster information processing and disaster pre prevention reduction uh, fostering cooperation with natural and public health sector, enhancing DRR capacities in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and the last point is the strengthening of scientific and technological cooperation among countries along the Belt and Road. Right. And then that is my uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, <laughs> once again, our portal, uh, the platform. Yeah, you can find, you can reach us at this uh, 3w.icas.org. We would really highly uh, encourage that you guys try the platform out and, and, and see your feedback or your even needs or comments. Anything will be greatly appreciated. And uh, over there, you can find my email address. So we're certainly open for cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Katie. Uh, for your presentation on this open engineering platform. Uh, I would like now to call uh, Dr. Leni Sofia Heliani uh, from uh, IB and OGM from Indonesia 
who will give us um, a presentation, uh, tell us the journey uh, in Indonesia on developing engineering accreditation system. So Dr. Lenny, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ai, Honorable Professor Sahabat, Dr. Heru, and the Excellency, all the panelists and participants of a uh, of very uh, important event, uh, the World Engineering Days. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. My, uh, the title of my presentation is Developing Engineering Aggregation System in Indonesia. Indonesia, with an area of about 1.9 million square uh, kilometer, is one of the populated countries with the total population of, of about 270 million, based on the data uh, 20, 2020. Of the population, around 1.7 million are ETIC students per year, which are accommodated by uh, about 26,000 study program. Compared to the other study program, the study program in field of engineering is one of the, the largest with the total number of study program is 5,600. With this a numerous potential and the condition among the study program are very diverse. It is very necessary to answer the quality, uh, high education and study program in Indonesia. One of them is through the accreditation mechanism as an external quality assurance system and also as a part of engineering value chains. The journey of the uh, establishment and development of engineering accreditation system in Indonesia is started with the establishment of national accreditation institution, Banditi, in 1994. In order to improve the quality of engineering study program to international standard and recognition, in 2013, the initiation of formation of Indonesian Accreditation Board for Engineering Education was carried out by uh, PII in collaboration with the Minister of Research and Technology and Higher Education, assisted by JICA and JABI. JABI was officially established in uh, 2019 and development process of EIB can be divided into two states. First state focus on the uh, accreditation criteria and instrument and the second state focus on the accreditation support system. The implementation of the uh, accreditation began in 2016 and now already entered the sixth accreditation cycle. Since its establishment, ERB has targeted to get international mutual recognition. Therefore, in 2018, ERB has submitted for a member uh, proposal, membership proposal to Washington Accord and obtained professional uh, membership in 2019. Further, in 2020, ERB submit for the signatory member and hopefully will receive the uh, verification uh, team within 2021. Uh, Following are the uh, comparison between the uh, engineering accreditation uh, system by Banpiti and EAB. The Banpiti is compulsory accreditation system by uh, regulation and using the output uh, outcome based evaluation. The instrument is uh, one fit, uh, one size fit for all criteria, and there is a ranking system by Banpiti. The lowest is the good, the new ranking system is good and very good, and the, the highest is the excellent. The scope of accreditation is national uh, level accreditation. Meanwhile, for the ERB, this is the voluntary accreditation system, and using the outcome-based accreditation, and the, there is a, a specific criteria for each uh, field. The point of the accreditation also uh, assess the continuous uh, improvement of the study program. There is no ranking and the scope of this, uh, the accreditation is international uh, level. The implementation of the accreditation uh, outcome-based accreditation by EIB is referred to the common and discipline criteria. The common criteria applies for all applicants, which is consists of four criteria as representative of VDCA cycle of quality assurance of the study program. The first uh, criteria is uh, 
assessment assessing about the formulation of the graduate uh, profile and the second criteria is about uh, uh, formulation or uh, designing of the curriculum and teaching and learning activities also human resources and facilities the third criteria is uh, consists about implementation of learning outcome assessment and the, the criteria for is for continuous improvement and internal quality assurance documentation system. Meanwhile, for the discipline criteria, EIB is equipped with criteria for 14 uh, engineering fields and one criteria for uh, general engineering fields. Following is some uh, important number. Uh, from the development and achievement of accreditation by EIB, the upper part of the figure show the number of accredited uh, program accredited by mandatory national accreditation BANPT uh, with rank A, B, and C. Then, and the rank A is the program that's eligible for EIB accreditation for general accreditation. And from this figure, we can see that. Uh, from the first cycle in 2016, the number of uh, study programs that apply for the accreditation was increased over time, showing the increasing of the trust of the higher education toward the quality assessment system implemented by the EIB. In fact, during the pandemic in um, the cycle 2020, is also still show the very significant increase in the number of the study program. That is a uh, 47 study program for general accreditation and 12 study program for personal accreditation. In order to ensure the implementation and result of the accreditation fulfill the standard, the training system also carry out to develop an adequate pool of evaluator for each engineering field. Currently, the number of evaluator from the higher education is already uh, enough. However, for the evaluator from the industry is still uh, lacking. So it is become a target to be achieved in the implementation of training uh, evaluate, evaluator in 2020. Based on the evaluation of the accreditation uh, result through the FGD and also questionnaire, there are several EIB accreditation in uh, Indonesia. The advantage for the student and graduate uh, is gain the educational basic for the mid uh, global standard in line with the science and technology development, support career, the support uh, career and professional success, and also wider employment opportunities. For the program in educational uh, institution, by voluntary network, the program demonstrates a commitment to provide quality education and global recognition, increasing competitiveness, and also cost saving. And for industry, government, and stakeholders, this opportunity for them to provide feedback on, cult, uh, on, on current and future uh, employment needs also can involve systematically in uh, continuous quality improvement in higher education and facilitate the professional uh, mobility. Following is the result of the implementation of the outcome-based accreditation in ERB. Uh, for an example, uh, currently many engineering uh, study program have implemented outcome-based education systematically. As so in this sample, the study program has uh, confirm uh, all of uh, each stage of education activities focus on achieving the program outcome. In the first stage, the study program defined the profile of the graduate and the outcome based on the university vision and also based on the stakeholders need uh, national standard and also international standard. The study program conduct the curriculum design based on the curriculum uh, backward curriculum design by establishing the body of knowledge and con, uh, course content that support the achievement of the outcome. In its curriculum structure, the study program also already ensure the fulfillment of a number of the credit for the basic science subject and also availability for the capstan design course that emphasizes the fulfillment of design skill to solve the engineering problem. In the uh, constructive alignment, is carried out by the study program by ensuring the appropriateness of the learning method and assessment method according to the uh, 
uh, outcome of the study program. Uh, based on the result of the uh, assessment, the program will evaluate and follow up to the uh, to produce a continuous quality improvement, which is the main uh, target of uh, outcome-based education. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lenny. I would like uh, now to call uh, Dr. Malik Adnan, uh, UNESCO Chair on Environmental Management and Infrastructure Development Engineering at uh, Saitama University in Japan. We talk to us about uh, engineering education for SDGs in the context of uh, of uh, this uh, UNESCO chair. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rai. Uh, yes. Anybody can see my slides, right? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I am Dr. Adnan Amr Malik. I'm from Saitama University, Japan. And uh, today I will talk on the role of engineering education in fostering sustainable development of infrastructure in developing countries. Okay, as you know that uh, the world is progressing towards sustainable development uh, in order to overcome economic, social, and environmental challenges uh, that are resulted from rapid infrastructure development. And during education can play a vital role to overcome these pressing challenges uh, through um, active based learning curriculum, uh, targeted research, and connection with the uh, industry and funding agencies in attaining various sustainable development goals. In this regards, uh, UNESCO Chair on Environmental Management and Infrastructure Development Engineering of Saitama University offers International Graduate Program on Civil and Environmental Engineering. The purpose of uh, this program is to produce well-grounded graduates from developing countries on the fundamentals of engineering principles. And in, in this way, uh, we have achieved uh, various sustainable development goals. Uh, now I would like to introduce International Graduate Program that helped us to attain various SDGs. Uh, that program is started in 1992 and we offers a master's and doctoral program for, for international students. Students from the developing countries can also enroll this program through various available scholarships uh, like ADB, Max, JICA and World Bank. Over 550 graduates from more than 30 countries have uh, graduated from this program and they are actively contributing to the sustainable development goals of their respective home countries in a wide range of capacity. Uh, we strongly believe that our strong connection uh, over the years with the alumni uh, help us to attain various sustainable development goals uh, through international academic collaborations. Uh, now I would like to show some of the international collaborations that helped us to, sus to obtain sustainable development goals. The first one is the development of pollution control and environmental restoration technologies of waste landfill sites, taking into account geographical characteristics in Sri Lanka. This project was under GST satraps. Uh, the project uh, manager and principal investigator are from Saitama University, Japan. Uh, the, there are many uh, institutes involved from Japan, as you can see in this slide, and there are many institutes involved from Sri Lanka as well. The major benefit is to transfer the innovation and technology and also develop the human resources among the both countries. And the target of this collaboration was SDG 6, 3, and 12. And the second one is the establishment of environmental sound management of construction and demolition waste and its wise utilization for environmental pollution and for re new recycled construction materials in Vietnam. This project is also under GS GST satraps and the principal, uh, or you can say the project managers uh, are from Saitama University Japan and from National University of Civil Engineering Vietnam. Uh, five years project and following all the institutes that were involved from Japan, and these are the institutes involved from Vietnam. The benefits or the, you can say the goals are the same as the previous uh, project. And in this uh, collaboration, we targeted SDG 6, 9, and 11. 
Now, the last one is a collaborative research network on standardization of design and construction for hot weather concreting based on Asian climate and materials. Uh, the country involved are uh, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and Vietnam. And this uh, collaboration is under JSPS core to core program. And the chairman of this program is from Saitama University, Japan. And we have the following institutes that were involved in this uh, collaboration, also from Sri Lanka and from Thailand and from Vietnam. Uh, the objective is the same, that we will want to innovate and uh, transfer the technology and develop the resources uh, in both countries. And we targeted SDG number nine. Now, moving on to the future action, uh, we believe that there should be a automated research collaborative mechanism uh, between the academic institutions and the organization that include government, private, international organizations, and industries. This kind of academic collaboration will enrich the engineering education in terms of uh, faculty development, curriculum upgradation, targeted research with state of the art knowledge and technology innovation and technology transfer and human resource development in developed and in developing countries as well. Increase in scholarship and employment opportunities for developing countries. Uh, this investment in engineering education will lead to attain sustainable development goals in more effective way that uh, which we believe. And that's it for today. And thank you very much for uh, al allowing us to express our views. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Malik, for uh, your the examples given by the work of the UNESCO chair is doing. Um, and uh, sorry, so I would like now to call uh, our, our last uh, uh, panelist, Professor Manolo Mena from uh, University of the Philippines, uh, uh, who will uh, give us a, a presentation on the role of engineering education uh, in. Um, sorry, um, on the role of STAM education in Southeast Asia and the Pacific is in the engineering education. Professor Manolo? Yes. Yes, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, happy World Engineering Day to everyone. This report is an offshoot of a lively discussion of the joint 2019 Japan Society of Engineering Education NAEESEAP conference in Tohoku University, Sendai, Japan. Uh, this was preceded by a country report from South Korea, which was talking about STEAM, a concept that was new to some of the attendees. After the discussions, a common perception developed was that arts is necessary in developing creativity and innovation through experiential learning. Thus, the AEESAP Executive Committee created a subcommittee to look into this concept. The survey dwells more on the appreciation of the arts as a necessary component of engineering, rather than the application of the STEAM methodology. STEAM meaning science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Engineering, arts, and mathematics. The respondents to the survey were Professor Elizabeth Webeck from Tohoku University in Japan, Professor Saad Mekilif of the University of Malaya in Malaysia, and Professor Elihia Clemente from the University of the Philippines. Results of the survey conducted among the three countries showed that general education or liberal arts courses are required as a part of their engineering programs. Common topics include philosophy, social science, ethics, sociology, and humanities. These courses appear, however, to have been added on instead of being integrated into the curriculum to develop competency on critical thinking, systematic problem solving, creativity, and collaboration. These are added as appreciation courses rather than integrated courses. However, noteworthy are the efforts of special programs at Tohoku University, faculty courses at the University of Malaysia, and the general education course STS 100 at the University of the Philippines. In the special Tohoku program developed by Professor Webeck, the ability to conceptualize, think through issues considering many perspectives, to think in a group 
to network, to critically analyze, to communicate well, to understand perspectives, to solve problems, to develop confidence, are cultivated and encouraged. These lead to leadership and superior thinking skills. At the University of Malaya, faculty courses such as thinking and communication skills, project management, law and ethics are utilized to develop well-rounded students who could emerge, who could merge their engineering knowledge into a societal, legal, economic, and environmental context with a capacity for lifelong learning. In the Philippines, science and technology uh, and society involves an exploration of the past, present, and future of science and technology in society and in the social, cultural, political, economic, and environmental factors affecting their development with special focus on the Philippines. Further studies are recommended if the current engineering curricula in Southeast Asia and the Pacific are to benefit from the true essence of STEAM methodology, which requires an integration rather than just a mere addition of the art subjects in the curricula. According to Dr. Georgette Yakman, one of the key practitioners of STEAM, STEAM is science and technology interpreted through engineering and the arts, all understood with the elements of mathematics. The liberal arts are supposed to add the who and the why to the what and the how of STEM. Critical thinking, systematic problem solving and design methodology, as well as innovation come from the minds cultivated by the arts. Worldwide interest in STEAM has grown in the past five years. Engineers are the interface between technology and humanity, and this can be learned better through STEAM. It is no wonder why many of the Nobel Prize awardees, including most notable scientists, are, are involved in the arts, such as playing musical instruments. According to Albert Einstein, if he did not become a physicist, he would have been a violinist. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Manolo, for your explanation about the STEAM education in our region. So, uh, dear panelists, we are actually uh, behind, and uh, we would like to ask you if you would uh, kindly agree to, to stay a little bit to reply to some of the uh, questions that we actually had for you. And uh, maybe we can spend an extra. 10 minutes maximum because people may have their yes, own. Yes, yes, exactly. That's, yeah. if, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Five, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Ten minutes? Fine okay. Me. okay, thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, uh, first of all, um, I would like to ask uh, one uh, question uh, specifically to Dr. Malin. Um, you have uh, told us uh, about uh, the review of uh, the international uh, benchmark for graduate attributes and professional competence and uh, highlight, highlighted the fact that uh, we needed uh, to continue the incorporation of SDGs as well as uh, uh, to stay uh, inclusive and uh, encourage diversity. So then um, I would like to ask you, uh, especially for that, um, how uh, how do you see then uh, the future of women in engineering and uh, how do you think we can improve the numbers uh, at the moment in our region especially uh, yes thank you thank you very much for that question it's a very big question and i can't <laughs> answer it in a, in a couple of minutes uh, but what we have done with the engineering education benchmarks is to raise the the level of awareness of the need for diversity not just to bring in women into engineering, but the way of working both at the engineering education level, but also once an engineer has graduated and is working uh, in industry or at universities or in academia or in government. So there are requirements here in the new benchmarks that talk about communication uh, with stakeholders of considering wide implications and working in broad teams. 
Communication is another new area that has been brought in and communication with taking into account cultural diversities, communication in various mediums, working with remote teams, which has become essential uh, in the COVID environment. This uh, thrust for inclusiveness will benefit everyone, not just women. We want to include everybody in engineering and we want the best intellects in engineering. And uh, we are hoping that these new benchmarks will provide a framework so that the engineers of tomorrow in perhaps a, in five or 10 years will have a new perspective, will have a new way of working, which is inclusive and which will encourage everyone to become an engineer and to remain an engineer because the losses are also another big issue that needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mali. That's very inspirational. Um, I would like now to ask, uh, hello, yes, uh, the Haiti, uh, you? Uh, about uh, the open um, uh, the engineering uh, open engineering platform and then how uh, Dr. Liu you see uh, it uh, coming into the open engineering uh, in open science uh, a past part of open science movement and uh, what are still the challenges uh, that uh, we have for that and uh, what are your suggestions for this? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, uh, like, uh, yeah, like what we have already uh, mentioned in the presentation, we do think that open engineering is a future trend in the Asia Pacific region. Um, in my present presentation, actually, we have said that this might refer to various uh, different aspects like open engineering data and educational resources, open platform, open community for all engineers in the region, open engineering knowledge services, and so on. Uh, and you have mentioned challenges. So challenges that we have been faced up with while developing such a platform uh, are as follows. It, it may, may not be uh, everything, but we have come up with the following uh, four, like first of all, due to limited access to our real users and then specific user needs have not yet been well identified. We have tried to turn to like questionnaires, emails, interviews, platform feedback, as well as user behavior analysis to help. But still we feel there's a long way to go before we well identify our, our user needs based on which we provide knowledge services on our platform accordingly. That's the first thing. The second thing, uh, due to the huge geographic and cultural diversity of all different countries in this region, uh, their respective needs for data and knowledge are also diversified. For example, coastal countries or small islands might be in urgent needs of tsunami, hurricane-related data, while inland countries might care more about drought-related data and also diversified religious beliefs and languages could lead to difficulties. That's another thing. And thirdly, um, different countries in this region feature imbalanced resources that can be shared and accessed openly. Also, they feature different levels of informatization, which might lead to uh, the differences among the capacity for data aggregation information, knowledge, processing, and analysis, which in turn would bring about obstacles in the development of an open engineering platform for all. And uh, fourthly, in the fourth place, yeah, like um, it's also something that has already been mentioned. Uh, we don't really have a common, uh, I mean, standards or a non-unified data standards. And this would definitely result in low efficiency in data sharing process, right? Uh, last but not least, um, since a sound mechanism for collaboration for all engineering uh, institutes, academies, organizations, and en engineers has not yet been built up. And then a sound uh, data or knowledge sharing process or mechanism has not been established. So maybe we could make more endeavors to call for closer and more active cooperation in terms of uh, academic, I don't know, academic forum, webinars, training workshops, research projects, and so on. Yeah, so above all, we believe that people's 
minds um, actually go first will determine where we go and how far we go. So we do think that um, agreement as to the necessity or as to the fundamental concepts of such a open engineering platform that benefit all should first of all be reached in our region. And this way we could really contribute to the, the increase of the engineering value chain as well as the construction of a knowledge-based society. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Katie. That's, um, yeah, we can see very clear steps for, for the future, and that's really great. Uh, I would like now uh, to uh, request uh, Professor uh, Chua um, to, um, you have uh, advocated um, some mobility for engineers through, uh, uh, through APEC Engineer Register and International Professional Engineer Agreement and so on uh, for a long time. And uh, then I just wanted to, uh, we wanted to ask you then uh, what you still foresee in a, a network and if you want to share um, uh, any further work that is done uh, within or beyond the, the region. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first, I must say that uh, I represented the Federation of Engineering Institution of Asia and the Pacific. We have uh, many initiatives. And uh, we got a lot of support, for example, from uh, Professor Shabazz Kand and the UNESCO uh, Bureau for Science uh, in uh, Asia and Pacific. We have been helping uh, developing countries such as Myanmar uh, to uh, set up their engineering accreditation system based on the FIAP education guideline. Uh, we have reviewed Philippines, Pakistan, and so on and so forth. And now we are in the process of uh, signing uh, an agreement with the Federation of uh, Engineering uh, Organization in Africa to help to develop uh, engineering accreditation system for the uh, African countries. So as I say in my presentation, uh, what is important is to build this confidence and the trust. Uh, within all the different economies so that we can uh, trust engineers uh, from other countries and uh, local partnership is important. We must also understand the culture of different economies and more importantly, we hope to promote and with the help of all the signatory, if they are not government agency, they must go back and uh, convince their government to change their rules and regulations for mobility. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Chua. Um, yes. Uh, yes, so I, I would like to ask uh, one, um, maybe a final question uh, to uh, Professor Misri. Um, so you have uh, showed us uh, the, um, um, the work that is done through ACAP, uh, and uh, we have see, uh, you have showed us some uh, difference and commonalities uh, between the different performance of engineering education and so on. And uh, so how do you see that fit within the value chain of engineering and the delivery of SDGs? You did start. Yes. Okay, uh, very very nice question. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is a very related to, to the engineering value chain because the engineering program education is the, the very start of the, the engineering value chains. So if we uh, want to make the all the track of this all the chains in this, so we have to uh, to to re, uh, revine the condition of this uh, this program. The, the challenging situation is not only the uh, the number of the, the engineers that we need uh, graduated from these programs, but also the quality. So that's why the accreditation talk by Ibu Nani is a very important one, and also uh, how to, Im to Im improve the, the, uh, <coughs> the change between this program and the PE or the uh, professional engineer and also the industry. Those are very important thing in this, this, uh, this uh, kind of chain, engineering value chain. Thank you very much. Maybe answer your question. Yes, thank you very okay. much, uh, Professor Misri. So yeah, so sorry we promised to keep it within uh, uh, ten minutes. So we'd like now to I would like now to uh, to thank all our panelists.
for this very um, important uh, insight. And uh, we would like to now the closing uh, closing part. So I would like to give back the floor to. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Ive, and thanks to all the panelists for a very fruitful discussion. So now let's welcome uh, Professor, uh, Professor Heru to give us uh, closing remarks on the way forward uh, for Asian and the Pacific. Thank you. Professor Heru, the floor is yours. Professor Haru, you are still muted. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lim. Um, I have a few takeaways to share with you. I think, uh, first of all, um, uh, for uh, today, when we have this World Engineering Day, we extend invitation to all engineers around the globe to uh, join the global effort to achieve the SDG 2030 to create a healthy and prosperous uh, prosperous earth that leave no one behind. And secondly, uh, all engineers acknowledge their role as the key players to solve the global issues and to achieve SDGs at 2030s. Uh, we learn also from this event that many efforts has been uh, made to standardize the engineering education and the professional competence uh, standards that are required to achieve the SDGs 2030s. We discuss also uh, the importance of engineer graduates that are required to face the challenges uh, current and future challenges to achieve the SDGs, including the inclusion of social science, which the understanding that uh, engineering is in between a technology and humanities, and we acknowledge the importance of uh, uh, social science, including arts, within the context of STEAM. And we learn also that many mutual recognition agreement uh, available existence in the existence uh, with the main uh, objective is a platform for promoting mobility of engineers. This also entail the opportunities to uh, integrate by all means of exchange and sharing information and data among MRA to establish a common global engineering platform to facilitate more on collaboration to achieve SDGs. And uh, with this, I would like to also emphasize the need uh, and the importance of collaboration, the importance of cooperation, cooperation among competitors rather than competition. When we uh, face the global issues such as pandemic, uh, with that, I would like to thank again all the uh, distinguished speakers, uh, participants, the panelists. Thanks for uh, your contribution to these events. Thank you, uh, Professor Sabas from UNESCO for your uh, partnerships. And we look forward to in include integrate all the inputs from these events into our joint publication. Thank you so much. Thank you, Very Professor. Much. Thank you, Professor Heru. And uh, now let's welcome uh, Professor Shabazz to give us the final uh, closing remarks on the recommendations and the main the future steps in Asia and, and Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Jai Yang. And thank you, colleagues. You stayed longer uh, than the 10 minutes we promised. So my apologies for that, but uh, let's just very quickly try to summarize so that these can be put into action. And the, there are three main areas here, uh, raising awareness about engineering. And in the question answers, I also try to answer some of the related questions. This is not just for now. We have to continue. Engineering profession, while it's very important, 
engineers usually are not in um, the right uh, levels of the government um, with the bureaucracy with and not uh, in prominent uh, places uh, such as there are not many engineers in politics so we tend to be ignored but there are exceptions in some of the countries so we need to continue um, and these are the recommendations you can see that SDGs 2030 agenda, the role of engineering, the role of data, and uh, gender um, disaggregated data, very, very important. Uh, we must continue to focus on those issues, and UNESCO will be happy to take it further in the region. Then also, how do we transform engineering profession, uh, and especially now with the SDGs? It's not something not happening. None of the SDGs can benefit um, uh, in terms of their true progress unless engineering is there. So we have seen uh, excellent examples from our panelists and uh, without going into details, let's go to the next step. Next step is let's continue this thinking uh, to be brought into the related forums, uh, the continuous professional development programs, as well as very importantly, the link of the value chain and the digital platforms which have been discussed. So UNESCO will be happy to continue to work in those areas with our centers and our chairs and with the engineering associations uh, such as the FIAP, AC, and what we are doing with the World Federation of Engineering Organization. So we have to make sure no one is left behind and engineering opportunities are for all. So that's where uh, mobility of engineers must be stressed again and again and again, because unless engineers are mobile and there are equal opportunities for their jobs and for their career pro progression, and also making sure that their skills are properly valued, that's really a challenge. And we need to continue to uh, build that into our advocacy for engineering. Open science is already there and it will be approved by the UNESCO's uh, uh, general conference this year, we have to continue to focus on open engineering. And for that, we need to um, make sure that the statistics on science, technology, innovation are properly taken on board. What is the status of the engineering itself? So we must uh, continue to um, bring that. Uh, also, we need to distinguish between science engineering and technology very carefully, while at the same time we bring the cross-disciplinary effort, and that needs a lot of collaboration and knowledge sharing. So those were some of the areas. So I'm very thankful to our team for putting this one slide together. And what would be from now uh, here on, uh, the presentation I hope will be available through our team to all the participants. Some colleagues have asked for the courses, uh, certificates, they are very usual. So for that, we will continue to do that. And also these next steps and recommendations, we will pass through our engineering program, both at headquarter, we will have uh, the honor of having some of very eminent colleagues uh, in the region and uh, internationally. So we request them to take them on board and a report from this webinar, we will uh, produce a succinct report, which can be sent to our centers, to our chairs, at the same time uh, to our headquarter in Paris. And also we have 13 field offices of UNESCO, and I will be heading one of them. And I will be representative to China and Japan and the two Koreas, and very importantly, also to Mongolia. So I promise, as an action from me, I will follow up with all the colleagues within my area of influence. So we make a pledge today, we will raise the awareness about engineering. We will continue to bring it into the policy fora and leaving no one behind. First of all, engineers should make sure they are not left behind. So we need to make sure they are fully engaged on board the standards are improving and we stand for mobility of engineers and for them to be recognized equally through proper accreditation and proper continuous professional development program. So with that, I thank you all and thank my team for this wonderful webinar. Thank you, Professor Shabazz, for the, for the conclusion and 
So thank you all for attending and we hope you have learned and enjoyed our presentations and we will thank you very much and we will be sharing. Take share a picture? <laughs> yeah, we will take a picture. Okay. Can all the panelists turn on their camera? Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone. That's three, two, one. Cheers. Thank you all. And for all the participants, thank you. We will send you the links after this webinar. So make sure you get all the materials and the certificate you required. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Let's keep in touch. Congratulations. Thank you.